Hello and welcome once again to Breakfast All Day. How is it going? I am Christy. That is Matt. That is Alonzo. Next up for us is a documentary called Kid 90, starring and directed by Soleil Moonfry. Matt, take it away. Uh, so Soleil Moonfry, we know as Punky Brewster. We saw uh, a significant amount of her childhood uh, on camera. And then once the show's over, she stays on camera, uh, but this time she's got her own camera and she shoots all the time. Um, 20 years later, she revisits this footage. She hadn't looked at it hardly at all uh, and put a film together. And it becomes this kind of fascinating look at a teen star growing up in the 90s with a bunch of other teen stars. Uh, and we learn a lot. This movie goes in a bunch of directions that I hadn't really expected it to go. Um, you get a lot of her kind of journey as, you know, a young woman and artist, you know, at least into like her mid twenties um, or at least early twenties. Uh, and you get, you know, she talks to a lot of people that she was friends with at the time and still is friends with. Um, and I found this fascinating. Um, I think she does a good job putting a lot of this together uh, in a way that like this could have been like, oh, look how much fun we were having. And, and you know, it's it does more than that. And I it's it's a fascinating glimpse at some of what some of these kids were going through, I think, at the time without, you know, at a time where like, yes, there's cameras on them all the time, but it's not like we have now with the Internet. Um, you know, because Mark Paul Gossler shows up, and uh, who else? Uh, David Brian, Austin and Green and Brian Austin Steve Green and Brian Austin Green and Zorgetti. Charlie Sheen does not look particularly good coming out of this movie, but it doesn't look particularly great anyway. Uh, but I I enjoyed watching this, and I I found it to be kind of moving. What did you guys think? I thought it was a total vanity project. I yeah. thought it was, it was navel gazing and shallow. Um, the nostalgia factor is quite compelling for the first half of it or so, because you're right, as you say, there, there weren't camera phones and you know, there wasn't Twitter and Instagram and all that to constantly document your life. And so the fact that she had the, the presence of mind to do that when you know, they're all partying in their teens or they're going on a road trip to the middle of nowhere or whatever they're doing, and she kept all of her voice recordings and all of her letters from people. And like, that is interesting as a, a slice of life. And just to see, you know, people like Brian Austin Green just hanging out or, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and like weirdly Mickey Rourke is at some party. Like he's way older than these guys are. But so as a little time capsule, I enjoyed it. But then about halfway through when she's 18, she goes to New York to study acting and just to get out of LA and just the toxic nature of it. Um, after Punky Brewster, she had some trouble getting work. And a lot of it was that she, um, for a young petite woman, had gigantic breasts. She was like a 38 triple D or something crazy like that. And um, it was a lot of attention for a 15 year old girl to be built like that. So she had a breast reduction and that was a lot of her identity. So she wanted to get away from, from that. But even that is something that I wish she had the chops to explore in a deeper way, you know, like the sexualization of, of teen girls in sitcoms or movies and how, how fucked up that is and the way that this industry forces you to grow up so fast and how, um, how toxic and how damaging that can be in a long term. I feel like she kind of skims the surface of all of that. And then when she goes to New York, she happens to fall in with like this whole skater scene and some of the people who were in kids, kids. the movie yeah. kids. And that is not nearly as interesting. It's the same kind of footage, but with like random people yeah. and it's not nearly as, as, as engaging. But then the, the larger point she's trying to get to about how re-examining all this footage now is so eye-opening because people were really hurting and they were trying to tell her and like it's it's a call to all of us to really listen to each other. That's that's a nice idea, but again, it feels like it's like she's dipping her toe into it and it's through her own personal experience, which ends up ultimately being kind of shallow. Yeah, I was reminded about how you remember when Honey Boy came out, the the, the idea that um, 
what's his face? Uh, Shia. Shia LaBeouf wrote the screenplay originally just as like an exercise in therapy. Like I think he was in rehab or something. And it was just a way to sort of like expunge his personal demons about his relationship with his father. And then it wound up, you know, kind of becoming a screenplay. This to me felt like an act of therapy for Soleil Moon Fry. And if it was that for her, great. I don't begrudge that to anybody, but as a film, as a documentary, it didn't feel like it really ever got to a grander point. I think it, it did feel like navel gazing. It felt like, well, this is stuff that happened to me and this is stuff that's important to me. And, you know, she talks about like the bad stuff. She talks about like sexual assault and she talks about, you know, like, I'll, you know there's like eight people at the end of the movie, you know, who are dead. Uh, and I think they would- no, I think it's most, 10. Uh, yeah, and like most wow. or all of them, I think were suicides, and so it's like clearly there's she's she's a, trying to address a lot of stuff here, and I think that maybe if she had collaborated with a documentarian or with with, or with someone who's more experienced at taking this kind of footage and these kinds of stories and turning them into something that that is either a personal statement or a grander generational statement that might have led somewhere, but. I, yeah, it just, I don't, I think this kind of is beyond her grasp and it just, it's so insular, it didn't ultimately mean anything for me. And then she goes back as she revisits as an adult with people like Brian Austin Green and Mark Paul Gossler and Stephen mm -hmm. Dorff. And a lot of that is like, remember when we did that thing? Yeah. That was so fun. That oh, look at me, happened. I'm so young there. Yeah, right, yeah. and again, it's like, it's it's so, it, it feels small and it feels a little alienating. You know, watching yeah. them, watching them reminisce about. Remember when we did that thing? That was awesome. Or that was sad. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I guess I went in this with really low expectations, just <laughs> expecting that it was going to be like, "Hey, here's what it was like behind the scenes." And I thought she looked like this could have been a better film with a stronger filmmaker weighing in on it. But I was surprised at the stuff that she was addressing either partly that it happened or partly that she was just willing to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now granted, you know, at the age that she's at and a mother of what, four kids, mm -hmm. like at some point you're like, yeah, fuck it, I'm going to talk about this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that she does talk about stuff that is fairly important. Um, and I think that some of the stuff she goes through resonates a little bit for a generation that is growing up potentially anyone in the public eye at any moment, right? Um, you know, I guess my take on this is, I mean, look, I will, I should have led with this. My youngest sister was at school with her um, through, I think, junior high and a little bit of high school. At that performing at, arts school in the at, Valley? No, at Campbell Hall in-, oh, okay. in um, oh, okay. Yeah, so not that they hung out much, but they, they were aware of each other. Um, and knowing some kids that were tangential to the scene at that time, um, you know, I found it moving the way she was going back through. I mean, look, like this is a woman who is, what, she's probably 40 something now. 45, um, maybe. 45, and has had 10 people that were close to her die, um, you know, mostly by suicide. Like that's, that's kind of harrowing and, mm -hmm. and, talking about with like Jonathan Brandeis and, and all of the times that she like wasn't there for her, for him and like can't help but go back and, and think what was she missing? Like, yes, there's a lot of voiceover and, and she does play too much of the like younger her and it is, it, it does get to be a little facile, but I still, I thought there was something interesting going on in here and I was kind of, like I would love, don't get me wrong. I would love to see somebody really, really sharp come in and work with her on this mm -hmm. because I think you would have something that was just probably a gut shot, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I still found it kind of interesting. I, okay. I, I thought it was kind of moving. Okay, so what's your number? Uh, eight. You said eight. I I'm think saying, it's worth watching. I'm saying five. I said five and a half. Okay, so six point two is our number. Where is Kid Ninety streaming? Hulu. Okay. Which is also where you can see the revived Punky Brewster series starring Soleil Moon Fry. Hey, what are the odds? I know, right? 
Synergy. There you go. All right. So thanks for watching, you guys. Uh, like this video. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, check us out on the social media at BeFast All Day. And visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash BeFast All Day. Every month, we let our subscribers choose a classic film for us to go back and review. Uh, this week, we are talking about their selection, which is John Huston's The Dead. Uh, so check that out at our Patreon and so much other cool stuff that's exclusive to our subscribers. See you guys next time. Bye. Bye.